three, two, one. Welcome everyone to Elevenses at World Builders. This is a part of our yearly fundraiser, uh, which benefit Heifer International. And we are doing panels every day to try and bring you moments of joy, acts of whimsy, spots of delight, and uh, find ways to find joy against the darkness. Because it's the darkest part of the year of a very dark year. Uh, we are especially thrilled today to have a panel uh, that, as you might notice, is near and dear to my heart. Um, Star Trek and Optimistic Science Fiction and Fantasy. And I'm going to quick introduce everyone on the panel, and then I will be disappearing. So, first of all, Martha Wells has been a science fiction and fantasy writer since her first fantasy novel was published in 1993. And her work includes The Books of the Raxura, The Death of the Necromancer, The Fall of Ilrian trilogy, and the beloved Murderbot Diaries series. Uh, with media tie-ins for Star Wars, Stargate Atlantis, and Magic the Gathering, science, short fiction, young adult novels, nonfiction. She's won Nebula Award, two Hugo Awards, two Locus Awards, and her work has appeared on the Philip K. Dick Award Ballot, the BSFA Award Ballot, the USA Today Bestseller List, and the New York Times Bestseller List. Her books have been published in 18 languages. Next to her, you'll see Benjamin C. Kinney, a neuroscientist, science fiction and fantasy writer, and Hugo Award finalist, the assistant editor of the science fiction podcast magazine Escape Pod as well. He no longer creates cyborg monkeys after too many nights delivering them Prozac. He lives in St. Louis with a Martian wife and at least three cats. As a scientist, he leads a rehabilitation neuroscience laboratory at a major American university, as a writer, his short stories can be found in magazines, both online and print, including Analog, Strange Horizons, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and more. You can find him online at BenjaminCKinney.com, and he swears that everything I've read in this biography is true, even the monkeys and the Martians. Uh, right next to me on the screen, you'll see Dana Pelabon, who has acted, directed, written, and produced for a variety of community and professional theatrical troupes. She's currently directing for Children's Theater of Madison and Music Theater of Madison. Most recently, she directed Columbinus. Am I pronouncing that right? Not even close. Oh, Columbinus. 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 Silly me. Small Mouth Sounds and Cabaret. She performs in and produces the cabaretesque troupe Foxy Veronica's Peach Pies and has also produced three shows for the New York International Fringe Festival and is a co-founder of the Loud and Unchained Black Theater Festival which opens in spring of 2021. Professionally, she is the co-executive director of the Rape Crisis Center in Madison, which is the second oldest rape crisis center in the nation. And she also is on the board of directors for World Builders and the Outreach LGBTQ Center and Little John's Kitchens. Sarah Goldie, who is our moderator today, started watching Star Trek when TNG premiered in 1987 and has never actually stopped watching, ever. A Hugo Award finalist for Best Fanzine, Sarah is the Editor-in-Chief of Star Trek Quarterly and has appeared on podcasts such as the Feminist Frequencies, Picard and Discovery Recaps, love Feminist Frequency, as well as Trek panels at Star Trek Las Vegas, Dragon Con, World Con, Wisc Con, Geek Girl Con, and others. You can also catch her in the Deep Space Nine documentary, What We Left Behind. A longtime friend of the Women at Warp podcast, she's thrilled to join the crew and lives in in a former arboretum in Portland, Oregon. She's on Twitter. I'm sorry, I'm gonna let her do the Twitter after at the end. And then, finally, our special guest, uh, Anthony Rapp is an American actor and singer who originated the role of Mark Cohen in the Broadway production of Rent. Following his original performance of the role in 1996, Rapp reprised it in the film version of the show and then the show's United States tour in 2009. He also performed the role of Charlie Brown in the 1999 Broadway revival of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and originated the role of Lucas in the musical If Then in 2014. His screen roles include Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets in the television series Star Trek Discovery. And um, as I said, I'm about to disappear, and yeah, to let people in the chat know, yes, we are aware of the coincidence of... Paul Stamets being in the room and there being someone named Gray who suddenly no one can see. So we are aware of that. Thank you. Uh, with that, Sarah has been um, working for a while. I want to 
say thank you for taking over moderating this panel. I also just want to say you can all see at the bottom a link that you can go to donate. We uh, had a great start to the fundraiser. We raised over 400000 um, but a lot of that was because we were grateful to the Humble Bundle community for giving us matching funds. We had 200000 in matching funds. Those have been used up, which means now we're on our own, so help us reach our goal. And uh, with that, Sarah Goldie, you have the con. So obviously when we're talking about optimistic sci-fi and fantasy, the first thing that comes to mind is Star Trek. And in Star Trek, Earth has become a utopia. There's no hunger, there's no poverty, there's not even any bad weather. Uh, so my question for you is, is there a difference between utopian sci-fi and optimistic sci-fi, or can we interchange those terms? And Dana, would you like to start? Love your earrings, by the way. Thank you. Um, Black Lives Matter. So. Um, first and foremost, I thank you so much for having me on this panel. This is uh, really quite the honor. Um, but there is a difference between utopia and optimism. Um, you know, when I think of how I saw Star Trek as a kid, um, you know, that was a very uh, non-problematic universe and everybody seemed to, um, to really be able to manage through things uh, fairly well. Um, there weren't um, systemic issues like, you know, you see in real life. Um, but when I read um, optimistic sci-fi, they they talk about that issue. So I've recently been reading Keetra by Gideon Marcus, um, and it is optimistic in that there is not um, a bad guy. There is not a, um, a large system that's coming after them. It is they have found themselves in a situation and they are working together as a team to get out of it. Um, and what what is parallel to me are things like everyone in that series is queer. Everyone in that series um, is is multiracial, you know, and and, and I, I really enjoy um, the thought of reading things where um, where we're not all fighting Thanos because we're not all fighting Thanos. And sometimes we just are, are living our lives. And um, I like to think I'm an optimistic person. So I, I enjoy reading, um, reading stories that, that kind of mirror that. Um, I think of uh, Becky Chambers. Um, I, I don't know that she would call her stuff utopian necessarily, uh, but it certainly is optimistic in the sense that it, it, it foresees a, a future in which all these various cultures and communities, much like Star Trek, can coexist and try to, you know, come together in some sort of, it's not an officially a federation in her case, but, uh, you know, an exchange of culture and ideas and economies. Um, but, you know, even, even in Star Trek, even back in the day, there still were conflicts uh, between cultures. You know, th they'd never met the Romulan Empire and that was like this big bad, possi possibly mysterious big baddie out there. So it was always about like the, the interface between this, this optimistic or utopian society if they do encounter something that may be not quite so egalitarian. Um, uh, so it, it's not that there's ever an absence of conflict per se, but you know what, what happens when those ideals are challenged by an opposing force? Um, uh, I also think of, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, which is to me optimistic, but also realistic in the sense that, you know, there's this optimistic idea. Okay, we can we can colonize another planet and try to take the best that all of our various cultures and sciences have to offer, and yet inevitably, human nature intervenes, and there's it's never as simple or as easy as you want it to be. I think of Le Guin's Dispossessed where these, these, you know, the, the, the yin and yang of, of, a, of a totally anarchist society and a utopian society and that there's holes and problems in each, but, it, but ultimately, to me, it's hopeful because it, it, it examines the possibility that human beings can transcend these differences. I think you can also have optimistic SF where there is a big bad like Thanos or something, or you're fighting against a dystopian system. I think the thing that makes it optimistic for me is that the characters, the people are, the characters are aware of the problems, whether it's racism or 
sexism or homophobia or whatever problem, and they're actually f actively fighting against it, where the characters are proceeding from um, not maybe a utopian sensibility, but the idea that things should can and should be better. And I think that can make optimistic SF, even if they're actually fighting against very um, frightening circumstances. And to, to jump off that, it, to me, I, I see utopian as a as a subset of optimistic because there are there's sort of multiple scales of how bright this future can be and a sort of a true utopia is is one where you know there's people don't have major problems um and then you can also have have things where where we have the confidence to that we can handle our problems. Problems will arise, but there's 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 nothing that we can't tackle as a when I say society, whether that's like a place or a galaxy. Um, and then there's also ones where where that optimism is about having hope in the face of of problems that aren't that that aren't immediately solvable. Um, that these things these there's just, there are systematic issues, and but but that we. We think we we are continuing to believe that we can solve them, even if there's that solution is not obvious in front of us, even if there's not a history of being able to solve these problems. And all of these things can be framed as optimistic, as long as there's. It, and to me, utopia is kind of just the the upper end of that scale, where there aren't these systematic problems. Um, but it's but but optimism is also about getting to utopia. Mm -hmm. I also so think um, utopia can feel very static. And that's one thing about Star Trek, why I don't really consider Earth in Star Trek to be utopian because it's never static. There's always, there's always a new challenge that they encounter and then they're always sort of fighting to make things better. So it's, I think it's, it's a kind of a striving for utopia situation, even though most of our, the problems currently we have now have all been solved there. So Benjamin, kind of going back to your scale, can you have dystopian sci-fi that is optimistic? Absolutely. Um, the uh, I, I was trying to hold back a lot of my recommendations for 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 later, but I, I guess like, them like everyone else, I'm going to launch them. Um, I was just um, some of the more sort of optimistic stories I know of are really about kind of dystopian situations that that see hope for the end to the dystopia or hope to build something that isn't dystopia. Um, example, um, Sarah Pinsker's Song for a New Day as a book about a world that looks, you know, this book came out last year, but boy, is it very familiar to a sort of post-pandemic um, environment like we have there. But it, it comes, the novel comes to a path forward to seeing how people, how we can eventually get out of this, this situation um, and have that hope and optimism again. Um, and there's, um, yeah, other it, there's even it's worth remembering that there's the distinctions of utopia and dystopia are these art somewhat artificial things that that work great in fiction and are hard to and don't realize that way on earth like people in times of you know when 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 civilization breaks down people don't turn into you know, dog eat dog, like dystopia and murder in each other. People come together in times of, of stress. There's, there's hosts of, of nonfiction research on this. The book, um, A Paradise Made in Hell, I think by Mary Roach is kind of the seminal one on this showing that in, in these situations that seem like they would produce dystopia, what you actually get is like wonderful little utopias of people helping each other. Um, so these things are, aren't even separable necessarily. I think Parable of the Sower is a perfect example of that too. Like the, the, this beautiful portrait of this young woman in what feels like a, to me, a very realistic possible dystopia in which everything breaks down and there are roving gangs of you know feral people. Like that is certainly possible. And even inside of that, there's this young woman who against all odds is able to find hope and able to sow seeds of hope um, around her. And it, so it feels, it feels incredibly grounded and then earned and also unflinching in its look at the, what human beings are capable of, but also unflinching in its look at what's possible if you keep you know, your courage about you and keep your, your ideals about you. Now, so we have a comment. In the dystopia, basically, 
the cracks to work into and exploit it. We have a comment from the chat from L. Little Sky Fay, who says, that's what I love about dystopian fictions, the analysis about what is going wrong and the proposal of a way to move forward to something better. So next question I want to ask is, why is optimistic sci-fi and fantasy so important to us as individuals or as a culture? She asks in 2020. <laughs> So for, for me in particular, I, I will say I, um, I read a lot of things that, that are specifically not dystopic because a good portion of everything that I do is fighting systems um, and is working towards um, a better world. And, and sometimes that gets heavy. It gets really heavy. So um, I go back to the things of, of my youth that bring me optimism like Godzilla. I mean, Godzilla brings me optimism all the time. And I know that sounds insane, but it's, it is that, that lovely ability to, to leave the, the world that you're in um, that can, that can be a lot and go into a place where um, it's entertaining, um, where you know that there's a solution at the end um, I enjoy solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. So knowing that there is a place where I can go to, to see that betterment of, of mankind that sometimes I don't get to see in my day-to-day -day existence um, is real important for me to be able to, um, to continue the work that I do. Yeah, Pacific Rim is a good example of that where things are really heavy really the world is at, in so much danger and yet these people never give up and they never stop and even the people the the uh, antagonists among the the human characters never stop lose sight of the fact that they're trying to save the world uh, benjamin or anthony would you like to weigh in can you do, do, just to, fr to reframe the question again because there's i know we're, we're sort of talking about the same thing but i just want to make there was I, I was thinking about the rosewater trilogy a little bit but i wanted to like make sure that i'm speaking exactly to the framing of the question it's yeah. okay if we go off off topic a little bit yeah <laughs> go for it well it's just that it's another to that's another example of like uh it's a it's a a society that's in many ways broken but there is this, this presence that's kind of helping, but maybe is also harmful, but it, it's just, you know, we've, we've seen so many portraits of, or the, so many pop culture or uh, current thinking on Africa is that it's sort of beyond repair or, you know, so problematic. And Tade Thompson finds a way to, again, unflinchingly show some of the issues and problems you know, the despair, the, you know, economic disparity and other issues, but still finds a way to have these characters driving the story that are trying to find a way to make a better world. Um, and it's super fun and super, you know, enjoyable narrative. And it's got a kind of like a, like a wild comic book feel in some ways, but it also feels grounded in a world that's recognizable, that's fantastical, that speaks to things that, that feel true, but also feels like it's, it's holding out hope for, for a better, better future. So it's an, you know, it's a nice, there's, I don't, I agree that the, that anything that feels optimistic doesn't have to look away from things that are problematic or dark or, or dangerous or violent or anything like that, um, that, that you can't, in some ways you can't have one without the other. Yeah, that, that's such a great trilogy. I love those books. Um, they should have won, <laughs> been up for more awards and won things that they they than they did. Uh, I thought I just thought that was pretty groundbreaking. Also um, about um, the importance of uh, optimistic science fiction. I really haven't been able to. I used when I was a kid. I used to read a lot of dystopian. You know, the world's destroyed and these kids are out in the forest trying to do whatever. And I really loved that when I was a kid. Um, what really got me out of that was Katrina and then Hurricane Ike. And after that, I was unable to read any dystopian fiction. And I still avoid it today. Um, I'm a little bit more nerd to it now. So I pretty much gravitate toward optimistic fiction. I know sometimes my definition of optimistic fiction doesn't match other people's. I know some people would find the Rosewater Trilogy you know, a little too dark for them. And because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of violence and, and things happening to the characters, but 
again, the fact that for me, the real dystopian fiction is when the characters have basically given in to their situation and they're being victimized or trapped in some situation and they're making no attempt to get out of it and kind of waiting for the help of outside forces because they can't, they're, they've become inert. And uh, that's what's really depressing to me. And that's sort of the kind of things that I'm really <laughs> desperately avoiding right now. Do you find that optimistic sci-fi has a link with mental health? Um, it does for me. I'm sure that's an individual thing um, that, you know, I know some people, the catharsis, uh, particularly in fanfic, it's like going out and reading, you know, horrible, sad fanfic about your happy TV show <laughs> because it's just that cathartic release. And, you know, being able to cry about something that is not real is sometimes very helpful to you in dealing with reality. Well, I, I belong to a Goodreads uh, a book club that, and there's a huge portion of our active members are huge fans of Murderbot. And, and they, many of them have spoken at length about how much, how seen they feel by a Murderbot and how, and how comforted they are by Murderbot in terms of anxiety, social anxiety and, and how that is embodied. So I think absolutely it is in 100% impacting their their mental well-being and then their emotional and mental health, for sure. They've, they've shared this many times over. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, that's kind of not what I was expecting when I wrote it. I, I wrote it basically for myself, to help myself with that. But I kind of see it. I know a lot of people label it as like robot horror or dystopian, but to me it's optimistic because, again, it's like these characters are finding all the cracks in the dystopia and all the ways that the dystopia cannot reach them. To, to take us further off topic and onto that topic, w one thing that feels really utopian to me about the about the murder bot works is the way it start. The early novellas are in a setting that is pretty much dystopian, and you get to realize eventually that actually this is just a quarter of the universe, and it's not like this everywhere, and it doesn't have to be like this. And that sense of 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 expanding your scope of of starting out trapped in this place where where it feels like the universe is terrible and then getting more perspective and realizing there are more options in the universe is a, is is a really optimistic feeling um, and in general this to bounce a little bit off the the mental health idea just sort of more more broadly speaking about mental states getting you know when when any of us feel depressed and beaten down seeing these stories where where those states are a temporary thing and not an end where 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 you know there there are still going to be solutions from you there will be ways th you will get through this and anytime you see that happen um it's you know that can be that can be a, a source of strength mm -hmm. i wonder I what know. sorry no, please wonder, go ahead. I wonder what the panel's thoughts are about something like the Wind Up Girl, which you know is so intense and so dark, but at the same time, again, I feel there's this driving force for people who are trying to buck the system and fight the system, and I do find some catharsis and hope in it, even though the world is so incredibly bleak, and it also feels very credible, a very credible future reality. So I can get that it's like a, like it's a heavy, it's a heavy load to bear to read that book. And it's also very violent and very dark, but I also feel like a kind of catharsis in reading it and, and, and hope that people, that you can fight that system and you can find a way out the other side. So I don't know that everyone it's would really ever call the, that book optimistic. At one end of my, of my spectrum of optimistic things, the ones where like you, the optimism is maintaining hope in the face of of these problems, even though one, even even though they do not seem to be solvable in any immediate way. But mm -hmm. yeah, that can totally be optimistic. I think that's a book I just warn people: it's brutal. It's brutal. It's brutal, but so to me, so a variety powerful. of issues. But I love it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I know when I'm feeling down, my go-to episode of Star Trek is in the cards from Deep Space Nine, where Jake and Nog, everyone's really depressed at the beginning. The war is not going well. Nothing's okay. And then Jake and Nog, almost by accident, cheer up everybody in the station. Things still aren't okay, but people are hopeful at the end. Yeah. And that's the thing that brings me a little bit of peace when things are bad. Yeah. 
Um, so what are some of the blind spots in optimistic sci-fi and fantasy? Are there attitudes or perspectives or ideas that we want to see more of or less of? And thanks, Benjamin, for this question. Well, to go back to KSR, to the Mars trilogy, I mean, it, it was written, you know, quite a while ago now. Um, so I forgive him some of it, some of the blind spots that he had in terms of there's almost zero queer representation in it at all, if I remember correctly. Like very, very, in, very super minor. And it's still widely, um, you know, U.S. and, and Russia based and very few other voices. You know, Hiroko is one of the few. And she's even a little bit you know, Asian other kind of mystical other Asian kind of thing. Um, so I think he did a better job with that, like in 2312 and, and other works, but, you know, expanding the view to to have multiplicity of voices and perspectives um, and seeing a future where it's not just dominated by, you know, white dudes. From, or that from, it's not, yeah. that it's not um, homogenized, you yeah. know, so... Mm -hmm. People, when they seem to uh, talk about this, uh, a utopian society, it is a homogenized society. And, um, and that erases the, the many beautiful cultures that are out there um, that aren't represented um, in, in a lot of things, you know, and even, even in, in popular sci-fi now, you know, you have a, a black character, for example, um, it doesn't have to be about their blackness, but how their blackness um, affects everything that it is that they do and see is not portrayed in, in the same way. So, you know, when I think about, you know, science fiction writers um, that I consider science fiction and fantasy, you know, I look into, you know, an Octavia Butler. I look actually into Toni Morrison's Beloved, yes. um, which for me... Um, I know that sounds, again, my view of optimism is a little bit different, but this idea that at the end of it all, she has done the thing that saves her child. Um, now, does that mean that her child is not with us? Yes, but it has saved her child from this thing. So this is that utopia for this woman uh, because her child is not enslaved moving forward. And, um, and I think that... Uh, popular science fiction is lovely. I love watching it. I love Star Wars. I love Star Trek. I love all things stars. Um, however, what I would love to be able to see um, more is um, people that not just look like me, because I was super happy with, um, with your show, Anthony, that um, has Michael as, as one of the leads, and she is lovely all the time. Um, but her blackness doesn't come into and doesn't come into that. And so when I am talking to my son or I am talking to young girls out in the community and saying, yeah, sci-fi is for you. This is what, this is what it is. And this is what it looks like. There's not, there's not that representation yeah. um, that there should be um, because there are a lot of things that have been written um, by black authors that, that just don't get the, um, don't get the play, don't get the uh, publications, quite frankly, um, because they don't have the opportunities and the representation to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that Beloved, in my, in my perusal of, you know, how it's shelved, it's, I don't think it's ever been referred to as a fantasy work, and it is deeply a fantasy work. It is a ghost story, and, and you know, it just speaks to that sort of strange resistance from the literary community at large to recognize. I mean, I think it's breaking down and I think it's more and more, you know, people like Ursula Le Guin, yourself, Martha, you know, they're, they're, they're more and more are more people who are being recognized. Octavia Butler, you know, is, has entered the conversation, you know, and posthumously. But yeah, there, there are so many writers who deserve to, to be seen and included in the larger conversation, in the literary conversation and vice versa. You know, Toni Morrison, Kurt Vonnegut, Don DeLillo, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Nettie Accor for. Yes. Love her stuff. The, um, she gets, uh, she's done some stuff that well, I think people might consider more dystopian. Um, the Phoenix, I remember mm -hmm. the name wrong, the book wrong. Uh, who Fears Death, yeah. Yeah, Who Fears Death and then the sequel uh, or the, the book that's kind of set in the same world. Um, but again, it's like people, again, fighting injustice, people fighting for freedom. Nobody gives up in those books. 
And by the way, Dana, just to let you know, you're apparently getting a resounding yes in the chat. <laughs> yeah, well, you're getting a resounding yes from all of us. Yes. Uh, uh, one thing I want to add in addition to that is, is uh, shows inequality in all its kinds t- is, is an unavoidable part of, of, of any society, you know, actual perfect equality is the kind of thing that would have to be micromanaged every day. Um, and a lot of, I usually find that when things are presented as a utopia, it often means the intentionally or unintentionally, it means something hasn't, th- that inequality has, is not being looked at. Yeah. Um, you know, in, you know, earth in the Federation is supposed to be a utopia yet. Like, the military hero Picard has his winery and his former assistant Rafi has a trailer. Um, and it's, there are still these imperfections that we, that, that stories often want to gloss over to present it's great. It's a utopia. Um, and, and it's important to keep our eyes out for where those things are and, and to know what these stories aren't, aren't telling us. Cause in some ways those are, you know, th- those are tied to the things that are barriers between us and utopias in the real world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a comment from moderator Zezi Olsen, uh, who says, this is so important, speaking to Dana's points, when people are properly represented, the negative people don't get to fill in the blanks. Oh, yeah. Well, that is a big blind spot of optimistic SF is so often it doesn't deal with racism and it doesn't deal with, you know, um, homophobia and the queer phobia and and it just it just skips those parts and to become optimistic and part of it's the problem with far future sf is you're you're skipping ahead to when those problems have been solved and are dealing with different problems Mm -hmm. and i think what we need is more kind of like rosewater which is it's near future um this thing set um uh closer in that can deal more with the issues we're actually all dealing with right now you know, I actually hadn't heard of Rosewater, but it's going on my reading list now. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. One, 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 one set of books I, I want to mention that I think do a great job of bridging that gap between this sort of utopian far future and the problems we have now. Um, uh, Elizabeth Baer's white space novels, um, particularly Machine, which came out this year, is it's a space opera. It's a far future that's pretty utopian, but it's really, but the story is in some ways really about how they got there. And, you know, mm-hmm. You, you know, humans live in a, there's a galactic, you know, sisterhood of all the, you know, of hundreds and hundreds of sentient species. And they, and, you know, humans have, they have like brain implants that they like modulate, like, like, mm, I'm getting too aggressive. I need to modulate that down. I'm going to let my like helpful AI, like, like tone down my anxiety right now. And like, these are the kinds of manipulations that they need to become a member of the galactic community. But so do all the other races. Everyone has come through their evolutionary history like the giant insect people. They're like, yeah, we used to eat our mates. Um, and we have right minding too to prevent so that we don't do that so that we can be civilized people too. Um, and the idea that, that we, the, the facing of the, of the challenges that, that we have in our uh, natural inclinations and, and realizing that, that, that these are maybe tackleable problems, but like it's a, but seeing what those problems are and seeing how to get at them, those books also have a thing where like, yeah, earth nearly failed and all the, um, all the, like all the Elon Musk types like went out on colony ships um, and left and they're still on these like slow generation ships that are going nowhere. And once they were gone, we were able to sort out our problems a lot better. (laughs) Yeah. If only. (laughs) So, um, I'm going to throw this question to Anthony first, and then everyone else can chime in. So Star Trek Discovery starts in a pretty dark place, um, which led to a lot of complaints about it not being happy and optimistic like 90s Trek. Um, I would actually argue that optimism looks different in 2020 than it did pre-9-11, and that Discovery is actually the most optimistic Star Trek. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you see optimism in Discovery? Well, I think that the you know from the get-go, um, setting, setting Discovery initially 10 years before the original series was meant to show like earlier days of the Federation. So it showed some growing pains, you know, it's sort of what we've been talking about. You have to earn some of what you get. Um, So yeah, it, it, and it did a kind of, you know, 
pitch, bait and switch a little bit in the approach. And so I think for some longtime Star Trek fans, I understand that they were a little bit, what's happening? We're in war and, you know, we have a mutiny. And <laughs> But all, all along the way, the goal was to get to this, to, to see how we got there. And now with our current season, spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it, but the one that's airing now, but we've jumped ahead into the far future. And the Federation is again at a kind of crossroads where there's been this big technological breakdown that has more, made the Federation more isolated and reduced its member states. And they're, you know, it's a little more wild west out there. And so they've had to kind of um, retract and, and, and kind of figure out how they're gonna operate. And we as the, you know, the, the time when the Federation was in a better better place are now able to hopefully get it to, to, to a better place in the future again. So it is, to me, that's all very optimistic, but again, it's going back to like, you have to, you have to do hard work to get there. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like snap of the fingers. And in some ways, you know, Gene Roddenberry, I think, you know, he purposely did make some of the things snap of the fingers. We're not gonna get into how we got there. We're not gonna get into how, we, we mentioned the eugenics wars. We say that these terrible things happen. So we, we, you know, in some ways it's sort of like Germany post-World War II, I think is the idea that Germany post-World War II, Japan post-World War II said, we're gonna do a lot of things to like clamp down on any of the, that bad stuff that happened to create a better, better future. You know, so I think that was part of the inspiration. It was it was written originally in the Cold War era, um, but he didn't go into the nitty gritty of how hard it, how hard the work was to get there. So I think you, you, we owe it. You know, Star Trek owes it a little bit to examine that. So that, I think that's part of what Disco is trying to do. We call it Disco, by the way. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm just terribly curious. Did you know from the beginning it was jumping ahead or? Did they let you in on that secret later on? Um, I can't remember when they first started talking about it. It seemed, yeah, I honestly don't remember when. It seemed like that was going to make some sense, though. But I think, yeah, I think it wasn't until, like, the middle of the second season that it became crystal clear. But, you know, one thing about being a regular on a TV show after, after you know, now we're in our fourth year, like, trying to figure out when I knew things or what I knew it was, like, my brain... I don't even know, Martha, you, you've written how many books now in your series? Like, how do you keep track of what happened? What, you, have, yeah, you have notes and things, but. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. So. When, you know, you should have gone back and as a writer, you should have gone back and done a series Bible like for the first book and you didn't, so. Right. So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. One thing that really stands out to me about Disco is that it's the most diverse Star Trek and um, there's this really great book called Letters to Star Trek by Susan Sackett, who is Jean Roddenberry's assistant for many, many years. And in that book, she talks about um, Jean's original vision for the diversity of the show and how he wanted his crew to be half women. He wanted there to be more people of color and he couldn't get away with it in the 60s. And I feel like Discovery is the first Star Trek that really lives up to that original vision. Yeah, that, and that was certainly intentional. You know, it's funny, I was having a discussion, just minor discussion on Twitter th today about a, sh a show that I follow and people are saying like, it is an all white cast and like, but they've been together for a while. So would it throw off the balance to introduce new people? I'm like, it's worth the risk because it matters. And yes, anytime you do it, yeah, it might throw things off a little bit, but it's also very, very likely that it will add so much. And, you know, we've had so much wonderful, fresh new faces on our show. So, you know, a lot of times I think historically, uh, it's in some cases like with Star Trek, initially the network said, no, you can't. But more recently in the last 10 or 15 years, and most networks wouldn't say that out loud for sure, it's mostly just been blind spots where they're just not looking, they're not aware of how white and, and cis their shows have been. And now, thankfully, there's so much conversation about it. So there, you, but you have to make an effort to do it. And, you know, yes, some people are going to complain, oh, you're just checking boxes. Well, yeah, sometimes you got to check some boxes to try to get some balance right. You know, there's nothing wrong with checking boxes if it's for a greater good in the end. Um, and especially when you have those multi multiplicity of voices in the writer's rooms and in the casting offices and the producing, directing chairs, et cetera, all the way up and down the line. So Disco, it's from day one, it was like, you know, Brian Fuller, the original creator of the show was like, we are going to have a black woman as our lead, which yes, it's a, it's a symbol, but it's an important symbol. And yes, I also agree, Dana, that 
because of the nature of the Star Trek world, it doesn't get into her blackness in the way that more contemporary stories would. That's sort of in keeping with the general Star Trek ethos, for better or for worse. But it still was conscious and, a, and, an, and an important and meaningful effort made to do that in the first place. But it did take them saying, we are going to do this. And so many shows haven't done that enough over the years. And, and I will say for me, when I saw the very first episode and that first scene, and there are two women of color, they are in charge. And I know people thought it was hokey, but you know they did the sand thing and then there was the Federation symbol and then the ship came in and I started crying because I'm lame. But you know, it was... It was the Star Trek that um, that I wish I could have been that first thing to see when I was a kid. Now, granted, Captain Kirk, hella hot, love all of that stuff. Especially However, the, tor the torn, the torn tunics. Right? Oh my god, for real. Um, but when I'm showing my son what is now to be able to bring that imagery to him and say, this is the thing that I love. This is what it is that I grew up on. And this is what it is now um, was so important, you know, watching them um, even, like I said, even just in that first episode, watching them interact, watching um, these two strong, capable women um, just doing their thing and doing it unapologetically. They were both making choices unapologetically. And for, for women in particular, you know, that is a, that also is just huge representation wise because women are, are taught to, to be in the background. We are taught to, to be the, um, the standing beauty of the whatever scene. It is, it is about something else other than our intelligence, our competence, yeah. um, our, our efficacy. So um, I, I commend you guys for, for all of the things that you've done to bring that to, to discovery because it's, it's important um, even for, for old folks like me to be, oh, this right here, this is amazing. This is where I want to see television go. Thank you. Yeah. And there, you know, there are some people who are like mad about it. There still are. You, you, you know, I'm, I'm still shocked and amazed, but there still are people who are like, oh, th there was a, a post the other, you know, a couple weeks ago, like where there's not one straight white man on this show. Where do I belong? And people are like, well, there's been like, you know, a hundred years of of material out there for you. So I think you might be able to get, get something back a little bit. And going back to the scene you're talking about, Dana, I do want to recognize that uh, Disco passes the Bechdel test in its second scene of the entire series. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we have some more comments. Um, My Chronic says, I feel like Discovery is more optimistic because it is more honest about how problems look and persist. Tell me the truth and then I'll believe you when you say it will get better. Mm. That's, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, unless someone wants to add something more about Discovery, we can go on to just the general geeking out about optimistic sci-fi books and TV and movies and comics. Um, I brought for show and tell my very favorite book of all time looks like it might be backwards i can't tell um no, it's not backwards though. you're good okay a uh, woman on the edge of time by marge piercy um i read it when i was like 19 for women in science fiction class and it's about a future that's very inclusive and sustainable i mean basically everyone's a bunch of hippies they live in small communities they have very communal society they don't have money um it was a lot of ideas when i was like 19 this would have been like 1999 um and i tell people this book is like 90 percent of why my politics are so left um and they they have things in this book that was written in the 70s things like non-gendered pronouns that I never thought would happen in my lifetime and that are happening now. And so this book is really what gives me hope for the future. This book and Star Trek, of course. Sure. I, I don't know that I'd heard of it. Thank you. Any other I've, favorites? I've got a whole bunch. Yes. Uh, for older work, uh, Janet Kagan, um, she died fairly young and she didn't leave a lot of books, but what she did leave was a really incredible. Um, Mirabelle and Hellspark, I think were some of the really first um, optimistic SF that made a huge um, 
uh, impression on me, particularly Mirabelle, uh, which is actually a compilation of several novellas. And it's a brilliant book about, it's, a, it's one of the few sort of optimistic generation ship stories, though it takes place after the generation ship has arrived at their planet. And um, Karen Lord, um, The Best of All Possible Worlds is one of my favorite books. And that's, again, it's another, it's a very optimistic book with people dealing with kind of a horrible situation and the aftermath of it and how they're moving forward. There's been a, it's kind of a, a coalition of, of different worlds, far future, and one of them has been destroyed. And it was the one that was basically, in Star Trek terms, it would be the one that was basically running the Federation and kind of keeping, you know, the, the um, more aggressive elements in line. And that's gone and they've, they're trying to find it's on a, it takes place on a kind of a refugee planet where they're trying to find a place for the, the displaced people that were on other, that didn't, weren't killed. And it's just a really cool book. And it's a really um, written in an interesting way. I love all her work, but that's like one of my favorites. Uh, Andrea Hairston, um, particularly uh, will do magic for small change as an optimistic fantasy. I absolutely love that book. And it's basically about, um, it's the one, the main character is a, one of the main characters is a young girl and it's understanding who your family is and your place in the family. And one of the really interesting things she does is almost every single character you meet, you have an impression of, and the more she learns about that person, the more irrelevant that first impression becomes. And it's uh, basically a story of this family through history um, and magic is involved with it and it's hard to describe but it's a brilliant book and um, I try to recommend her, her most, most recent one is a is a more epic uh, secondary world fantasy called Ma uh, Master of Poisons and that's a brilliant book to do and that's a lot about people fighting against um, ecological damage and, and climate change and human damage on on their environment and but in a fantasy context that's really brilliant um older again um diane Dewayne's wizard books uh, they're young adult about kids who become wizards and are sent out into the galaxy to save to save the fix the galaxy's problems basically and um there's a whole series um really cool it's kind of i actually encountered it more when i was an adult and it's kind of the kind of thing i wish there had been there in the 70s for me to read when i was growing up because so many of the there was so few books for children that had female characters who weren't the load or the babysitter in groups of adventurers. So uh, that's one reason why I started reading science fiction and fantasy early, very, way too early in a lot of cases, um, because those were the only books I could see where the covers had female characters. I also wanted to mention Jessica Reisman's story collection, The Arcana of Maps which is her uh, fantasy and science fiction short stories. And those are very optimistic and will make you cry because uh, they're just so beautiful in some cases. I'd like to, I've, I've already mentioned a bunch of works, but um, I'd like to mention Charlie Jane Anders. Um, oh yeah. I, th I think All the Birds in the Sky is, there's, there's like this, for me, there was like a joy that courses through that book, even when things get pretty dark at times, there's, there's just like a spirit to his characters, the, a life force that courses through them. And, you know, um, City in the Middle of the Night is, is much darker in many ways, but again, it still is about people trying to fight the system, you know, and, 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 and uh, it's, it, it's, it's like, its ancestor is the dispossessed to me and, and in some ways left hand of darkness, but these, the, these stories about dualities and how do people find their ways in, 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 in societies and worlds to try to keep things so binary, which, you know, it's a theme that's I think also super relevant today where things are so seen in black and white often and you know, this, you know, right and left and everything like that, so. By the way, Charlie Jean Andrews, she's a huge Trekkie. Yes, <laughs> yes. I wanna shout out Walter Mosley. You know, Walter has worked with Discovery but also has a huge, huge collection of um, not just science fiction, but um, regular fiction. And and he's one of my favorite writers. I really, really enjoy reading um, his work. I have a, a lot of 
even though I've already given a couple of my big ones, I definitely have have more. Uh, yeah, well, let's just give um, everybody yeah, like a reading right. and watching list. I hope, I hope, I hope somebody in the in the chat in the audience is like keeping a list of all the things that we mentioned here. <laughs> there's so many of us. I'm like, I haven't heard of that one. That sounds amazing. Um, to start with, kind of the the the, the big and well known ones. Um, well, huh, the good place. It's a fantasy about how we can be better people. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of books, um, Mary Robinette Cole's Lady Astronaut novels, um, starting with The Calculating Stars, really about people having to come together. It's an alternate history science fiction set in the 1950s and 60s, and they are, and it uses that lens to tackle the racism and sexism, which of course are somewhat different today, but you know the, the parallels are very clear, but it's people having to come together despite and, and deal with those issues under and 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 do be successful at sciencing and and courage and doing all the things they need to save humankind um uh an int different kind of utopia would be the culture novels by uh, ian banks mm -hmm. other big space opera stuff but it's it's really set in a utopia that's really convincingly utopia so all the stories are out at its fringes because there aren't a lot of interesting stories in the utopia and it's mostly about how the utopia's secret service tries to make other places better um which i mean it, usually they're doing the right things not always but it but uh it, it's a it's a different angle of of uh, utopian fiction um what else did i want to mention um if you if you want to try short fiction, um, a good sampler to, uh, to to my own horn here or our own horn uh, would be I would definitely recommend Escape Pod as a good sample of optimistic short science fiction. It's a podcast that I that I work for. We're we're uh, the original uh, science fiction podcast, but they just do readings of of short stories, um, and we definitely like optimistic and uplifting ones. Um, so you'll see a lot of that in there. I also want to throw in um, Peter F. Hamilton's Commonwealth novels, which are another one where Earth has basically become utopia. We have wormhole travel. Everyone basically lives forever through one method or another, through the books as society evolves. Um, so the conflict comes from outside. But they're a lot of fun. All the books are like a thousand pages or something. They're, you buy a paperback, it's that thick. So they're, they're a good bang for your buck. We we got to have more than this. More optimistic yeah. sci-fi. I mean, I, I guess 50 years of Star Trek covers about 50% of it. Sure. Um, I wonder, I don't think that the, I wonder how the Expanse writers, because like in parts, part of I know what they've talked about is how they envision this world where, you know, a blended society mm -hmm. where, you know, everyone has some mixture of some kind of genetic something or other there's something optimistic about that that there's not those divides as much anymore but it is still a story about just you know huge disparities and power structures and things like that so you know i don't know how, how it fits in exactly but you know i mean i, I i'll I, I i could go on and on about the how like becky chambers work the, the first the first book in the in the trilogy that I read, it felt like a very nice warm blanket and very very sweet and 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 intimate and there was a there was a lovely energy to it. Close in common orbit, um, this the second book, things there were darker elements which I think in some ways to me earned the sweetness all the more because it you saw how how hard some of these characters had to work to get to a point where they felt like they could have some hope. So I think I'm always drawn to that, where it's not just like hearts and flowers, but that, that people have to go through something to come out the other side of it. Speaking of Becky Chambers, I'm going to, I'm actually going to recommend a, a novella of hers from a, in a totally different setting, To Be Taught If Fortunate. It's, it's kind, large swaths of it are very optimistic and exciting as these, you know, enhanced explorers go out to, you know, look at possible colony worlds and things like that in, in, in space. And, but part of it is also about what do you do when that optimism is taken away? And how do you handle it when those, when those big goals and hopes 
are being are, are being stuffed down, and that ends up being sort of the crux of the end of the story. And it's it's a really wonderful novella that is about about where to find and hold on to that optimism. Um, Gray says they're definitely going to make a list and post it on World Builders. Um, and there was a question earlier about whether the three body problem would fit as dystopian or optimistic. I. I find it very pessimistic. I don't know about utopian versus dystopian, but I consider it deeply pessimistic, and I, I strongly disagree with its view of uh, that. That is that is another panel entirely, but I strongly <laughs> disagree with its view of uh, interplanetary relations. Well, I thought of something. So, uh, you know, hmm. C.J. Cherry is somebody who's been around forever, but who I just discovered in the last year. I've started to read some more of her work, and. I mean, her work is pretty dark, and, and her vision of the, these these power structures it's pretty intense. But there's something. There's one of the books in her sprawling multi. I don't even know what you call it. It's called Forty Thousand in Gehenna, and there's stuff about it that's really intense and really rough. But there's 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 an aspect of the story that's about how sentient beings can find a way to communicate and come together that I found deeply moving and hopeful. But the journey to get there is really rough. So again, I don't know if it would count as, op like people would read it, it's like, it's tough and rough, but there's something beautiful about the possibility that two, two, two beings that don't think, that don't seem like they could find any way to communicate or connect do find that way. I, I really like that we haven't settled on a single definition of what is optimistic SFF here. There are so many different ways to do it and different ones are going to resonate with different audiences and they they all have the power to really help us and support us and and do for us to really enjoy yeah again i don't know if anybody would think of octavia butler as optimistic but and yet i do find you know you know because bleak things are bleak like things are bleak in the world they're bleak in many many places it doesn't mean that you still can't find ways to find hope mm -hmm. you know um, I want to throw in The Scar by China Meville, which is the sequel to Perdido Street Station. I actually read The Scar first, and I loved it. And I went back and read Perdido Street Station. It was just too dark for me. But The Scar, I find to be wonderfully optimistic. And it's got this society that's kind of built of all these ragtag people who were the outsiders from wherever they came from doing these incredible things. Um, so yeah, that's another favorite. Yeah. Um, I wanted to recommend Nettie Okorafor's young adult books, Akata Witch and Akata Warrior. Um, those are really good. Uh, I And I don't know, I, I think they, they fall in the category because sometimes things are fairly dark for the characters, but you get to see kids finding their place and find in, in um, finding their magic, finding each other, um, plus a really cool... Um, vision of this of um a magic system based in africa um i really enjoyed those also for tv stuff that just made me really happy this past year legends of tomorrow um really which started out with a very depressing concept that these characters are the people who kind of disappeared from history and then proceeded on into just complete wacky fun um banana pants uh, stuff um, that always makes you smile and also Star Trek Lower Decks which I yes. absolutely loved yeah uh, kind of so like cool. it's, it's almost like Galaxy Quest except Star Trek yeah <laughs> with that kind of meta commentary on the different things that have happened uh, I really enjoyed that yeah I wonder if we could like like the Broken Earth trilogy which is incredibly bleak and is a major interrogation of so many systemic issues and still, it's also about a community of people coming together to fight fight the power and and people up 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 ending those systems. So there is hope mm -hmm. in it, you know. But it's it's a it's it's tough going, and 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 you know, the hero of that story is an intense person who's like filled with all sorts of rage. And but you believe I believe her and I understand her. So you mm -hmm. know, uh, but it, yeah, I, I don't know that. I wonder if. if Jemison would consider that hopeful, but you know, I I don't know. You know. Well, it's like all the hard work that has to be done before you can move forward. Is yeah. that's what it feels like those books are about. Yeah. Looking for a variety of ways to get into up to 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 use and find that optimism. Actually, 
going to mention um, Max Gladstone's craft sequence books, which they're not really a series, but in theory, they start with three parts dead. It, it's a secondary world magic fantasy, a little bit steampunky, that's really about modern capitalism. Like the metaphors of modern capitalism made literal. You pay for things with bits of your soul and like banks are gods and, and, and you, yeah. Um, and it's about, in much of it is a, that many of the books are about sort of finding connection and meaning in these systems that are designed to, you know, extract and concentrate wealth. And and how and and where you can can both sometimes the change is only at a personal level, but sometimes it is at a larger level. Like the way these systems can be proved, where they can be used, and when they should, what are their, when they should and shouldn't be used, and and by making it very much about modern, it, it's sort of fitting in that like we want grounded like the the advantages of grounded science fiction. Like this is it doing that in fantasy. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is certainly refreshing. Um, a couple more suggestions from the comments. Um, Nadia Korfor's Binti series, yeah. um, The Orville. Um, this is How You Lose the Time War by, um, it's by Amal Motar, and I can't remember the other author's name. Max Gladstone, the Max same author I just mentioned, actually. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, some good ones. Someone was saying The Expanse has the most optimistic haircuts in sci-fi. <laughs> Uh, My Chronic says, Wild Seed by Octavia Butler makes me want to fight someone, but I haven't heard enough perspectives to figure out if it's just my own individualism making me angry at the apparent loss of autonomy. Well, she was always writing about that, too. It's like, yeah, how do you how do you stay? Can, is it possible to to find an individual voice and autonomy in a system that's always fighting to oppress and repress you? You know, and uh, yeah, which I think is an honest question, mm -hmm. you know is answered by the many of us who currently live in an oppressive <laughs> society that um, find our own autonomy. So it's one of the reasons why I do love her so much in particular. And someone was asking if the overarching arc of the Altered Carbon series would be optimistic. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. I can't comment. I've, I've... Me either. The TV or the, the books? They didn't the specify. Series. I've only the seen the TV show. Ends a bit um, optimistically, the second, at least the second season, or both of the, the seasons, but um, it's a very depressing environment this person is stuck in. <laughs> um, people yeah. fight against it quite a bit, and, and re revolting against it is one of the, the, the big themes of the show. Um, in what happened in the character's past and um but i don't know um i didn't find i i enjoyed the tv series but i'm not sure i found it optimistic yeah i i, I agree i it, it it has some optimistic elements and a lot of pessimistic elements um i certainly loved it but yeah. uh i don't i don't you know your mileage may vary but but i'm with i'm with martha on this yeah i love the ai uh, um it was one of the best characters for me, at least the, the AI controlling the Edgar, uh, Edgar Allan Poe hotel. <laughs> do you, do you find it interesting that, um, that stories about AI seem to be finally getting away from the trope of that AI are always going to be trying to conquer and kill us all? You yeah. That's not, <laughs> and let has have some interesting things to say about that, about, um, that idea of, you know, we have the evil AI who has to be destroyed because it's going to kill us is basically the slave narrative about we have to we have to construct the slave enslaved being as something that is evil to justify the fact that we're enslaving it. That's interesting. And um, that that was where that narrative and why it keeps coming up over and over again. That's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I could definitely talk for a whole hour about AI narratives. Um, I have a lot of it, it, th th this very quick thing I want to say about them, at least in relation to optimism, and pessimism is, is that I think this is, it's certainly good that we're getting out from that one, that one story that was so persistent for a while, but we need to keep an eye out for the new ones because of the ways in which AI is used in systems of oppression is very different from what we were thinking it would be 10 years ago. 
um, where where it becomes a tool to magnify our own biases as much as I mean many other things too, but that's definitely something that it does um, magnify and outsource and grappling with the future of of how humans are going to work with this technology, both what they are going to be and what we are going to use them for is a one of the huge, I think, questions of, of one of the many huge questions of science fiction um, that can take us in an optimistic or pessimistic direction. I was just reminded of another thing. Mass Effect, I think, is hugely optimistic. And I think it definitely follows in the footsteps of Star Trek, for sure, in many, many ways. But it's, you know, and at the same time, there's really bad stuff that goes down in Mass Effect. There's like, you know, eradication of entire world civilizations. But it's about, a you know, all these other civilizations coming together to try to bring hope back to the galaxy kind of thing. And, and all those characters feel alive and the cultures feel earned and respected and multiplicitous in and, and wonderful ways. And, you know, as a video game that is capable of achieving really rich emotional narratives, I think is also a wonderful testament to what's happening in, in current media that that, that that sort of thing can happen. Yeah. Mm. I wouldn't say that the last of us, well, boy, the last of us, that's probably one of the bleakest things I've ever experienced, you know, but at the same time, there's also, there, there are these embers of hope of human connection in the last of us, you know, also, even though it's like incredibly bleak. Well, if no one has any additions to the reading and watching list, um, why don't we see if we can have Gray come back in and give us an update on the fundraiser? <gasps> Why, here I am. That has been Hello, fantastic. Uh, we have been taking notes as fast as we can <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to try and keep up. Uh, thanks for giving us all of the, um, the reading lists that we're all going to be using for the next who knows how long. Um, and you caught me off guard because you said give you an update on the fundraiser, and I haven't had that up because I've been listening to all of you. But I can tell you that right now we have $411,057 raised out of our $500,000 goal. Um, and we are really, really appreciating it. Our teams, uh, as expected, Pat's, Pat Rothfuss's Twitch team is in the lead in terms of uh, team raising. But it's interesting in that Oots Change Jar, which is Pat's son, uh, is, is in third place, which is pretty high up there. And uh, so I would, I would just personally suggest that if you're thinking of donating, donate to Oots Change Jar so he can kind of catch up to dad and kind of throw that into his face. So. Yeah. Um, but we, we really appreciate all of you uh, uh, coming in and doing this. I'd like to just ask uh, if there's, I'd like to share any particular ways that people can continue to follow you um, online uh, because obviously you all have such amazing things to say that people want to hear more. Um, Gandy, can we start with you? Where can people find more about you? Um, so I'm on Twitter under Raging Journey, and then I'm, I'm on Facebook because... You know, I'm in my 40s. I think I'm supposed to be on Facebook. And that's Dana Pelabon. So feel free to friend me on either. And I'm on Insta also. I'm recently on Discord. I don't really know what Discord is, but it's all under my name. So, yeah. You, you can see her co-hosting our um, telethon, 1965-style telethon that's going to be going on on the 9th in collaboration with the Galactic Journey and Gideon Marcus. Um, Benjamin, how about you? I am mostly on Twitter at, at Ben C. Kinney. Um, I've got a website that's BenjaminCKinney.com. And in theory, I'm on Facebook, though. If you look for Benjamin C. Kinney, you'll find me. But I don't use it very much. Cool. Martha? Uh, I'm on Twitter under Martha Wells uh, 1. I have a website at MarthaWells.com which is just basically just the book information. Um, and I'm on Dream With Journal under Martha Wells. Great. And Sarah, thank you so much for moderating. You did an excellent job. I really appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. This was so much fun. It was just like talking about books with friends. I want yes. to be better, right? <laughs> Um, you can catch me on Twitter at Sarah Miyoko, S-A-R-A-H, M as in Mary, I-Y-O-K-O. Um, I'm on Women at Warp, and we're at Women at Warp on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can find my fanzine Star Trek Quarterly on Facebook. Excellent. Thank you. 
Anthony, uh, obviously, you have people uh, following you a lot of times. I have to say, I was expecting this to be pleasant. I did not expect you to out-geek me uh, mm-hmm. in terms of your knowledge of books. And when you hit Mass Effect, I'm like, well, that's it. I lost because I don't even play, <laughs> play that. So now I have something to look forward to. Um, thank you so much for doing this thank and you. taking time out thank of your, you. your schedule. Uh, how can people find you outside uh, of the obvious? <laughs> on Twitter at Albino Kid, on uh, Instagram at Albino Kid 1026, which is my birthday, um, and on PlayStation Network, although I haven't been gaming a lot lately because I've been working so much, but also Albino Kid 1026. Um, those, are, those are probably the main three, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, Facebook, but I don't. I only use it to follow my my poker group on there. <laughs> I don't do anything else on Facebook anymore. Gotcha. Well, thank you again, all of you. Uh, this has been a big help. Uh, all of the money that we raise, a hundred percent of it goes to Heifer International and uh, people. The prizes and things like that that we're doing are things that have been donated by our sponsors and by friends of World Builders, uh, including things like reading critiques and gaming design critiques. Uh, And we also, because these days not everybody can donate something, if you just spread the word or tell people about it, worldbuilders.org is really all you need to remember. Um, And we uh, want to keep on bringing just moments of joy to people uh, throughout this this, uh, whole fundraiser. So thank you very much for helping us be a part of that. Thank you for having us. Thank thank you, Greg, and thank you all. This was was a ton of fun. This was great. Long and prosper. Come on, come on. Can you do it? Can everybody do it? All right. Yeah.